this is Patrick Hebert again, and today's podcast is going to be a little different. For one, I don't have a guest today, so if you don't want to hear me speak by myself, now would be a good time to switch this off. But if you're interested in the truth about climate change, I'm happy to have you stay on and listen to me give you some facts about the topic. I'm calling today's podcast episode Climate Change Obsession because that's what I believe we are living through these days. Let's start with the obvious premise that no one on the planet wants to see garbage in the oceans and the rivers or pollution in the air. Everyone wants as clean an earth as possible. I think that's obvious. Even my own company is called Eco Villages and we care about nature, but we're quick to point out that we are eco-sensible and not eco-fanatic. The world's government's current obsession with climate change, in my opinion, is really to create fear, which in turn is a way to collect taxes and control people and to redirect money to entities run by certain people who conveniently invested in these companies that benefit from fixing climate change. But today's talk isn't about why I think the world is obsessed with climate change. It's about systematically going through a dozen reasons why we shouldn't be buying into this obsession. One thing I need to make clear, the planet has always had and always will have climate change. There is a big fiery ball in our solar system that controls most of that and has for many millions of years. In addition to the sun, we have geological events like volcanic explosions. So anyone that knows anything about climate change knows that it's been happening since the dawn of time. And at many times the climate was much warmer than now and at least, and at times a little colder. The real question ultimately becomes, how much is man impacting the climate? And if it's not much, or maybe even unnoticeably, what is spending trillions of dollars on it and scaring people about the future going to accomplish, other than to control where the money goes and who is considered the leaders of the planet? So because I'm basically robotic when it comes to emotions, my wife will tell you that, it's pretty easy for me to look at this topic purely researching for facts and not taking one side or the other. No, I'm not a geologist or a climate specialist, but I do have a degree in computer science and a lot of history with data analysis and research. Years ago, I became interested in the truth about climate change when it became personal to me. And it became personal when my daughter told me she was concerned about having a child who would be my grandchild because she was afraid that the world is ending due to climate change. And what kind of person would she be bringing a new life into this terrible, terrible world? I was shocked at that because I honestly didn't realize how governments and mainstream media had put the fear of death into this generation. Started to think about how terrible it must be to believe the world is ending, well, in 12 years, if you believe AOC. I thought to myself, well, I personally think that in 50 years from now, or maybe 100 years from now, the climate will be slightly warmer or slightly cooler, or maybe the same, but life will go on as it does now. But how horrible must it be to think it's ending, the whole world's ending? Of course, it's possible that a nuclear war could end life on the planet, would, I don't think it's gonna be climate change. So when it became personal, I decided to use any free time I had, which isn't much, to research the topic for myself and go into it with as little bias as I could. It's an ongoing process, but I can honestly say that I've gathered enormous amounts of information over the past years, and it, for the most part, is extremely well encapsulated in Gregory Wrightstone's book, Inconvenient Facts. To some extent, I'm about to, what I'm about to say is somewhat covered in that book more eloquently than I cover it. But I recommend you get that book and read it or listen to the audio version. It's very worth it. So let's begin with carbon dioxide, CO2, the stuff you breathe out and the stuff plants take in. At a high level, plants need carbon dioxide and they take the carbon out of it through photosynthesis and expel oxygen. In turn, animals need the oxygen and we breathe out carbon dioxide. It's a pretty amazing cycle and it's been going on forever. So let's get to the facts. Here's fact number one. Carbon dioxide, CO2, is plant food. More CO2 means more plant growth, and that feeds more people and helps to end starvation, which it is already doing. The world is getting greener because of the increases in carbon dioxide, and that's a good thing. So let's not villainize this stuff. One of the reasons the world hunger is way down from the past is because, partly because of the increase in crops due to more CO2. The more CO2 there is, the less plants need to keep their pores open to gather it, which in turn allows them not to lose as much water through evaporation, and that means plants can grow in drier climates than they used to. The world has 9% of its living, people living in poverty today. 200 years ago, that was 77%. So thanks, capitalism and CO2, for your help with fixing that problem. 
Check out this graph that I borrowed from Gregory Whitestone's book, which shows how green the world has become, which is a far cry from the barren wasteland we are told it's becoming. So let's move on to fact number two. In the last ice ages, CO2 levels were dangerously low. When CO2 gets too low, there's very little plant life and everything is at risk of dying. Everything, plants and animals. When CO2 levels are higher, plants flourish like they have in the past warm periods. And to some extent, how the earth is getting greener every decade now. Fact number three, our current geological period, which is called the Quaternary period, has the lowest average CO2 levels in the history of the planet. And an increase in CO2 would not only be good for life on the planet, but it's on the verge of necessary for life. Fact number four, there has been roughly 18 year pause in global warming with a bit of warming again in the last couple of years. All the while, CO2 levels were rising. So how connected is CO2 to warming? I admit that's a short period of time, but how connected do you think it is? After World War II, the CO2 levels rose, but temperature fell for many years, causing scientists by 1974 to think we were headed for another ice age. Time magazine never actually had a coming ice age cover that was kind of doctored. But there were several articles in Time and other magazines at that time about scientists' concern that for three decades the temperatures have been dropping. That was a little blip in the period. Fact number five, the modern warming began long before coal-fired plants or the Industrial Revolution or whatever man-made trigger people want to think started our recent warming trend. The current warming trend we are in, aside from that small cooling time of about 70 years ago, started in the mid-1700s, which is at least 200 years before the Industrial Revolution and before man could have made an impact on the climate. Fact number six, for some reason, warming and then cooling trends usually last about 10,000 to 15,000 years, likely due to the sun cycles or variations in our own planet's orbit. Our current interglacial period is 11,000 years old, so it could keep a, on general warming trend for a while, or we could start seeing some cooling, or maybe nothing, but likely unnoticeable in our lifetime. Fact number seven, we are constantly warned of how a half a degree change in temperature could be catastrophic. Yet 120,000 years ago, it was eight degrees Celsius or 14 degrees Fahrenheit warmer than it is today. Polar bears loved it. Greenland didn't turn into a tropical oasis, but more plants grew and animals did better than ever. In fact, we probably exist as an intelligent species with organized societies because of that warming time. It was an abundant time on Earth, as shown by fossil records, and by all data, it was a great time for plants and animals, including humans. Fact number eight, based on geological historical events and evidence, current warming rates are very similar to earlier periods over the past millions of years. If you look at the graph, I'll show here again from Gregory's book, you'll see that there's nothing unusual about our current warming or how fast it's happening. The rate it's happening is happened quite a few times before and long before man could have had an impact on it. And even if you look just at the last 10,000 years, it was warmer for 6,100 of them or 61% than it is today. Fact number nine, have you noticed that mainstream media stopped calling it global warming and started referring to it as climate change? That's partly because we keep getting years with no warming, sometimes flat, sometimes cooling a bit, and partly, and this is maybe the most important fact I've mentioned yet, we are living in one of the coldest periods of all of Earth's history. It is the coldest it has been in 250 million years. For most of the planet's history, it was on average 10 degrees Celsius warmer than it is today. Warming is a good thing. We should be much more concerned about cooling. Many more people on the whole planet die from cold every year than from heat. Fact number 10. Only 0.3% of scientists surveyed stated that global warming was mostly man-made. That 97% of scientists believe we are causing climate change is simply not true and has been debunked. As that data that was created, that stat was not properly gathered. Regardless, science is not consensus. Let me repeat that. Science is not consensus and consensus is not science. As a past software guy, 
I knew that even if everyone thinks that a software bug is caused by a certain thing, it doesn't make it true. It could be something, and usually was something, completely different than what everyone thought it was. So even if 97% of scientists stated that climate change is caused by man, which would likely be due to where their funding is coming from, it still doesn't make it true. Fact number 11, sea level increase began more than 15,000 years ago. Melting the northern polar ice caps would not increase sea level because it's over water. Much of it's over water. Much like ice cubes melting in a cup don't make it overflow or increase the level of the water, ice expands as it freezes and then takes up less volume when it goes back to being water. The southern ice cap, on the other hand, over Antarctica, is mostly over land, and so it potentially would affect sea levels. However, strangely enough, the temperatures in Antarctica have been cooling in almost all areas except one small part of it. And the amount of ice cap in the south has actually expanded over the past 100 years. So the steady small increase in sea levels during this interglacial period that we're in today is not changing any faster than it was for a long, long time. Finally, fact number 12. And this is a bunch of facts packed into one. And go through them one at a time. Forest fires are decreasing. Hurricanes so far this year, as of today when I'm recording this, is six. Last year it was 21. And we're nearing the end of this year's hurricane season. So it's likely it'll be down a lot. But one year or even one decade's numbers don't make a long-term trend. However, this is important. Hurricanes have been declining in frequency for 250 years and have not gained in intensity either. Heat waves are not becoming more frequent. Extreme heat events have actually been declining. The number of tornadoes has been declining. In fact, the number of tornadoes in 2016, which is pretty recently, was the lowest ever recorded. And by the way, the polar bear population has been growing steadily for 50 years. They're actually becoming a bit of a problem just north of where I grew up in central Canada because of the numbers of them. So you can say this isn't a fact, but why does mainstream media create fear with lies about these things? We hear hurricanes are increasing. We hear heat waves are increasing. We hear forest fires are increasing. Polar bears are dying. Yet all these things are not true. Is it stupidity, the lack of research, or just regurgitating what they are told? Or why does the media say this stuff? After doing my research, I discovered that we basically are being lied to. Almost everything about climate change we're being lied to. It's for each of you to have your own opinion on why, but like my son always says, when wondering why someone's not telling the truth or you want to find out who is a perpetrator in some event, follow the money. I personally think that there has been a multi-pronged approach by some group out there to create authoritarian governments and everyone knows the way to control people most effectively is through fear. And then when people are afraid, you just need to tell them you're the answer to their fears. Just give me all your money, follow me like a disciple, give up your freedoms and I'll fix the problem and take care of you. Does that remind you a little bit of COVID? But hopefully I'm wrong, and it's just ignorance that is making people say these things, and the media say these things, but I doubt it. If you wanna have more information, I highly recommend the book I mentioned earlier, Inconvenient Facts by Gregory Wrightstone. After years of research on this topic on my own, after it became personal to me, I finally found Gregory's book and could have saved myself a lot of time. He brilliantly puts it all in one place for people with short attention spans like me. And uh, so I really recommend the book. Thanks for your attention and for letting me get this off my chest so I feel like I haven't wasted years of research just on myself. And until next time, take care.